the jihad between the servant and himself. And at this point, we like to remind uh, people, our brothers and sisters in Islam and non-Muslim guests, that we should not, some people say, uh, because a hadith that you've returned from the greater, lesser jihad to the greater jihad, this is fabricated, then the idea of a, a greater jihad, the struggle against the nafs, it has no validity in Islam. This is erroneous. Similarly, some people say after research, the hadith, izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah, wazhad fi ma'inda nas yuhibbuk nas. Turn away from the world, detach your heart from the world, and Allah will love you, and turn away from that which the people possess, and the people will love you. So they say, oh, this is. Uh, a broken a chain with a broken hadith, therefore it's weak, and we can't verify the Prophet said it, therefore there's no zuhud in Islam. This is erroneous, because the concept is substantiated by other evidences besides this hadith. And if there were no zuhud in Islam, as some of our modern day uh, luminaries understand, then several of our greatest scholars have misunderstood our deen. Imam Abdullah, uh, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal has a book called Kitab al-Zuhd, the book of otherworldliness. Imam Abdullah bin al-Mubarak, bin al-Mubarak has a book called Kitab al-Zuhd, the book of otherworldliness. Imam al-Bayhaqi, al-Bayhaqi, rahimahullah, has a book called Al-Zuhd al-Akbar, the, the great detachment. Imam al-Qurtubi has a book called Kitab al-Zuhd, etc. And the, the, many of the Sahih compila compilations of hadith, such as Imam al-Tirmidhi's, there's a chapter, Bab Kitab al-Zuhd, the chapter of otherworldliness. So have all of these people misunderstood Islam? And now in this century we've un uh, understood it. And similarly, the idea of a, a struggle against the nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, Qad aflaha man zakkaha wa qad khaba man tassaha. That he succeeds who purifies it, and he is ruined who pollutes it. Pollutes what and purifies what? Purifies his soul. Corrupts his soul. So this, this, this purification involves a struggle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran on the tongue of the wife of the Aziz of Egypt in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, peace be upon him, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةُ بِالسُّوءِ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي إِنَّ رَبِّي غَفُرُ الرَّحِيمِ so she says that I do not absolve myself from any blame. Verily, the soul inclines or commands to that which is vile, except the one my Lord has mercy on. Verily, my Lord is most merciful, most forgiving, or most forgiving, most merciful. So she's talking about the inclination of the soul, which she has conquered. She's engaged in this struggle, because at the beginning of the story, she blamed everyone but herself. She blamed Yusuf, alayhi salam, that he's too good looking. That's why she tried to seduce him. She blamed uh, Yusuf. She, she, she blamed the women of the court when they couldn't resist themselves. See, you can't resist them either. She gave them all knives, gathered them together, gave them knives. Yusuf would go into the room and they screamed and cut themselves. See, look, you can't resist it. But at the end of the story, after she's elevated and struggled and purified herself, she said, I do not absolve myself of any blame. And Allah Ta'ala talks about another nafs in the Quran. That I, I swear by, uh, the, the day of resurrection, and I swear by the self-reproaching soul. And again, this is an indication of struggle. The first soul, the Ammara Basu. Now, the soul that commanded with good is beginning to question, to wickedness is beginning to question those acts. 
and to struggle. A struggle is going on. So it can transcend those acts. And then Allah talks about the soul that has transcended those inclinations. Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya fadakhuli fi ibadi wa dakhuli jannati O oh, you uh, contented soul, soul that is attained to tranquility, peace, and rest, return to your Lord, pleasing to him, and he pleased with you, well pleased with you. Enter into my paradise, enter, enter amongst my servants, enter into my paradise. So now, this is a progression, if you look at these three verses, uh, together, from the soul that commands to good, that commands to wickedness, to the soul that is reproaching and blameful, and questioning the acts of wickedness that the person falls into from time to time, to the soul that's contented and at rest and peace, that has transcended those inclinations. This progression involves a struggle, and the struggle our scholars have referred to as the jihad against the nefts. The struggle against the nafs. And the means for this struggle are many. We'll mention a few. And we mentioned this the other night. Uh, first of all, we have to feed our soul. Soul food. <laughs> Not that soul food that they might sell in some parts of Chicago. I mean, we could eat soul food. I grew up on soul food. Uh, but now there's aspects of soul food, the soul food diet that is strictly forbidden, <laughs> the pig feet. Uh, but we're talking about another type of the, so the collard greens, cornbread, mashed potatoes, that's all acceptable. The pig feet and the hog maws and ribs and all of that will leave for others. But we're talking about another type of soul food. This soul food is, the scholars say, first of all, Silence, to be quiet. Because the, the greatest undermining of our spiritual nature comes from the damage done by our tongue. Because this is the quickest expression of the inclination of our souls. You might can't always do something wrong, but it's very easy to say something wrong. So the first check on those inclinations is to be silent and to restrain our tongue, and not to give expression to every thought that comes to us. And there are forces that want us to do just the opposite, to constantly uh, talk, and to never experience silence. And we mentioned this, uh, people live their lives nowadays surrounded by oral stimulation. And if they're in a state of silence, most people will go crazy after a day. You put them in a padded, well, an unpadded cell, all alone, total isolation, no music. A lot of people would go crazy after a day or so. Because why? We've been accustomed to constant stimulation. And this stimulation uh, incites the negative inclinations of our soul. So we wake up to music, clock radios. We used to wake up to alarms buzzes and bells and ringings and dingings. Now we wake up to music. We go into the shower and turn on the radio. We go down to breakfast and turn on the stereo. And we get in the star car and surround ourselves with stereophonic sound. And then we go to work and we fight with each other as to what kind of music we're going to listen to. And then after the battle's resolved, we listen to music as we work, and then we get in our cars with our stereophonic, or I don't know, they might have no more advanced sound systems, digitally, digitally engineered, I don't know. And then we drive home, and then we go to bed as we listen to Beethoven's Fifth or something. And this is how we live our lives. But to, to, to appreciate what the, the spiritual inclinations we have, we need silence. The second food for our soul 
is uh, isolation. Because when we're isolated, there's no one to express our negativity to. There's no one to lie to. There's no one to, to backbite about. And by not engaging in these practices, the good inclinations within us come to the fore because these negative ones are dormant. So they recede, and then our good inclinations come to the fore. And we have time to think about our Lord and think about the meaning of life, the higher purpose of life. So this requires isolation. We know the Prophet wasallam, before he was called to the prophetic office, he withdrew from his society and went into the cave of Hira. And he used to reflect and he used to meditate and contemplate. And this is very, very important for our spiritual winning the spiritual battle. Uh, the third uh, food for our soul is hunger. Because physical food feeds our physical appetite. And a lack of physical food puts those appetites into recession. So our spiritual, the spiritual nature that's within us comes to the fore. So there's an inverse or relationship between the two. The less physical food we eat, the more spiritual food begins to nourish our souls. And the, the less the drives of our carnal nature influence us and push us. The fourth uh, food is the night prayer. And the night vigil is essential. There's never been anyone who's attained any station with Allah except that they spent a portion of their night in worship and devotion. This is a rule that's inescapable. In the Nashiat al that the standing in prayer at night is more penetrating and beneficial for the soul. Why? Because there's stillness, there's silence, and there are, there, there are things that exist in the day that we're not even aware of. At night, we can hear things five houses down. During the day, we can't hear from the next room. Because there are background noises that are bombarding our, our senses, traffic, people talking, doors slamming. And it's, we don't, we're not aware of it until it's gone. And the only time it goes away, in most places, maybe if you're in New York, the city that never sleeps, even then. In most places, is at night. Is at night. So at night prayer, Night prayer, night vigil, contemplation, reading, meditation is essential for the elevation of the soul. So these are four foods that we can feed our soul to help to win this battle, to go from that nafs ammara basu to this nafs mutma'inna. The second thing is the remembrance of Allah, constant remembrance of Allah in all of its manifestations. Because the remembrance of Allah draws us near to Allah. And it, makes, uh, it brings the love, it makes the love of Allah reality in our lives. You can't love someone you never think about. That's why they say uh, distance separates. You see, two people are madly in love, so their parents are conspiring. Uh, we'll send them to different colleges. So in high school, oh, there's madly in love and then this one goes to UCLA and this one goes to Princeton. So for the first week they send emails to each other and the second week every other day and the third week once a week and then the fourth week they meet a whole new circle of friends and then after two months it's all over and their parents are drinking tea celebrating. He was no good for it anyway. Takbir, Allahu Akbar. So, remembering Allah, why? Because the distance, it led to forget. They forgot about each other. So by remembering Allah, we endear ourselves to Allah. And by endearing ourselves to Allah, Allah Ta'ala elevates us. And this is the way of the believer. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, uzkurullaha dhikran kathira, fadhkuruni adhkurkum. So you remember someone, they remember you. You send them a letter, they write back. You come to visit, they reciprocate. Al-jaza' min jinsil amal. 
So we remember Allah, remember me, I will remember you. وَاشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Give thanks to me and don't reject thanks for my blessings. So remembering Allah, this is another very vital aspect in winning this battle. Because the more we remember Allah, the less we think about the inclinations of our soul. There's no time. And the, the, the true lover is the one who every thought is consumed by their beloved. That's all they think about. And again, this is how believers are is thinking about others that turn us away from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُوا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْ دَادَا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ Amongst the people there are those who take equals besides Allah whom they love as they should love Allah. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ those who believe are most intense in their love of Allah. This is the believer. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ So this love helps us to overcome the soul. Because the soul is trying to incite us to things, but we don't hear any of it. We don't think about it. All we're thinking about is Allah. The meeting with Allah. To please Allah. To do those things which are pleasing to Allah. And thirdly and finally, we mention this, the, uh, a weapon in our battle against the soul is identifying and eliminating the defects of our character. And again, why? Because this helps us to attain to the prophetic virtues. And a person who's adorned himself or adorned herself with the prophetic virtues is a person who is isolated or insulated himself or herself against the inclinations of their soul. That you mean wahadukum hatta Allah this hadith will come anyway. What are some of the defects? Anger. The Prophet said don't become anger. La taqdab. So we want to, we fight against ourselves until we become halim, forbearing. So things, insults, abuses, don't bother us. We forbear. So we fight against the inclination towards anger until we become halim, forbearing. Envy, we fight against that by wishing increases for people. Instead of things to be taken, blessings to take, be taken from the increase. Someone's beautiful, Allah give them more beauty. If we fill our heart, becoming envious. They have a nice car, give them a better car. A nice house, a bigger house. Allah increase your blessings on your servant. This is until we become a very magnanimous person. If we find ourselves stingy, avarice, and we fight against that until we become altruistic. We want everyone. We give a preference to everyone. Instead of holding on, we give freely. So we have ethar. And we know this ethar, or giving preference to others, is a big part of our Islamic uh, ethical system to give preference. Muslims are people of ethar, tafaddal. And not just going through doors. There, everyone has ethar. So no one so much to just come and push us both through the door. Get in the door, please. So everyone has the thought when it comes to that, but when it comes to the, something really meaningful, the tafaddos become scarce. Uh, we need last night, the brothers, Imam Siraj said, who's going to give $20,000? Tafaddal. <laughs> Squeezing blood out of a rock. So, is in meaningful things. Arrogance, we fight against ourselves until we kibr and ujib, conceit, until we have the quality of tawada, or we can intentionally humble ourselves. And not just humble ourselves in our actions and manners, to subordinate our thoughts, our personal preferences in matters. Okay, perhaps you're right. So people think it's humility just to walk very meekly 
Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. It is with great pleasure that I address you this evening. So, man, that's a humble brother. <laughs> then we say, I think we should do it this way. Astaghfirullah, la, haram, bid'ah. We can't do it like that. We have to do it. There's only one way, my way, or the highway. So humility is also humbling your opinion, humbling your thought, giving preference to someone else's idea. So this is, these are three things that we can do. So reiterate, feed our soul. We mentioned the four foods of the soul. Silence, isolation, hunger, and night prayer. Be constant in the remembrance of Allah and to try to identify and fight against the negative characteristics we have until we adorn ourselves with the prophetic virtues and characteristics. And this all involves the jihad of the nafs.